Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the guest lecture organized by the Department of Economics of St. Joseph College Autonomous Bangalore. I would like to welcome our guest speaker, Ms. Kiran Pereira, who is the chief storyteller and the founder of sandstories.org. I would like to welcome all the faculty members of Department of Economics and the students and participants who are attending the event from all over the country. Today's guest lecture will be on the topic, the global sand challenge. When we think about sand, we often think about beaches and holidays, but sand is also used as a resource in many industries. Surprisingly, we are facing a sand crisis, which may be having a detrimental impact all over. But today we are quite fortunate to have someone like Miss Kiran to give us her valuable insights into these and what exactly it means for the economy. I will now request Ms. Shraddha to formally, formally introduce our guest for the afternoon. Ms. Kiran Pereira is the founder and the chief storyteller of sandstories.org, a platform that is dedicated to finding solutions to the global sand crisis. She is a Bangalorean and is now settled in London. She is the author of the book Sand Stories, Surprising Truths About the Global Sand Crisis and Quest, Quest for Sustainable Solutions. She has participated in the award-winning documentary, Sand Wars. She was part of the expert panel at the World War Week, World Water Week in Stockholm. The session, Sand Mining's Concrete Threat to Rivers, Impacts and Potential Solutions was jointly organized by the Stockholm Environment Institute and Worldwide Fund for Nature. Ms. Kiran was part of the expert panel for the United Nations Environment Program Roundtable in Geneva that was organized to bring stakeholders together. The outcomes were published in the Sand and Sustainability Report in 2019. This report highlights that the overuse of sand is one of the major sustainability challenges of the 21st century. She was also part of the expert panel for Chatham House discussion on sand monitoring and management for a sustainable future. Thank you so much for being here with us, ma'am. My pleasure, thank you so much. Anushka, you are on mute. Please unmute and. Am I audible now? Yes, yes. Please go ahead. Uh, thank you, Ms. Shraddha. Before we proceed, participants, you are most welcome to leave questions for Ms. Kiran in the chat box. Also, we will be sending the poll in the chat box, which will be important for your attendance. So you all are requested to give your two minutes and fill the poll as it is the prerequisite for your e-certificate. After the lecture, we will be opening the session for Q&A where they all will be addressed. So without any further ado, Ms. Kiran, the floor is all yours. Thank you very much. Are you able to see the slides now? Yes, ma'am. OK, great. So thank you very much for um, this opportunity. It's such a privilege to be here and I'm, I'm really grateful for technology to enable this. Um, Bangalore, of course, holds a very special place in my heart and as so does uh, St. Joseph's. I remember uh, I studied at Mount Camels, but I often did many certificate courses in St. Joseph's. So I remember spending a lot of time there and it was really, really brings back very fond memories. So I'm here to talk to you about the global sand challenge. Um, as was mentioned in the introduction, this is the uh, one of the biggest sustainability challenges of the 21st century. And um, we use sand in a huge number of ways. It's used in a huge variety of things that we use in our everyday lives and we take it for granted. So. I want to shed some light on who are the top users and how um, how it impacts us and how it impacts the environment and explore if there are solutions. OK, so the top users of sand are the construction land reclamation industry um, and industry in general and energy sector. Uh, if you look at construction, the construction sector, concrete, for example, has become the dominant way of building. And concrete is about 60 to 75% sand and gravel. If you think about glass, 
if you see all the you know buildings that have glass facades, um, it takes about 70% sand to make those glass facades. So it's um, these are huge consuming industries. What, what do I mean when I say industry? Most of the metal objects that you see around you are produced in a, by an industrial method called sand casting. And for every ton of molten metal poured, you require about three to six tons of sand. So this is the kind of, um, even when we talk about the energy sector, you'll see in the picture here, the energy sector involves a huge number of things, right, from fossil fuels to uh, renewable or clean energy systems that are, uh, whether it's solar energy or dams, they require a huge amount of sand uh, in order to make the concrete. So why does it matter? Why is this problem urgent now and why should we consider it? It matters because the 20th century saw a 23 fold increase in natural resources used for building. Clearly, this is not sustainable. So the most popular definition of sustainability is meeting the needs of the present without uh, taking away the opportunity of future generations to meet their own needs. But if we are consuming sand at such a uh, fast rate, at much faster than nature can uh, replenish sand. Sand is actually a non-renewable resource as far as policymakers are concerned. And the challenge arises because not every kind of sand is suitable for use in all these uses that I talked about. You need very specific types of sand. And these specific types of sand are coming from places that are really, really precious, um, where the sand has other ecosystem roles to play. So what are the impacts of extracting such a huge volume of sand. I'd like to play uh, just to give you an idea. This is uh, in North India and you'll find a sim similar scenes of sand extraction across all the rivers in India and tributaries um, and not just in India but in many parts of the world. So you can see we're absolutely destroying rivers in our quest to get uh, more sand. What are the impacts? You see people losing homes and houses along the side of river banks. Uh, they're not only they're losing their life savings that they invested in the in building these homes. You find countries losing infrastructure because of uh, you know or, or because of erosion. Um, the constant extraction of sand from riverbeds, 24/7 extraction, is causing the destruction of rivers, and it's stopping rivers from being rivers. Um, it also has impacts on people who do this work, so manual uh, laborers. For example, you see a picture at the bottom. This boy has to has to dive down more than 20 meters below the river uh, just to fetch sand with a bucket. Uh, no protection, no safety net, no, nothing, you know, so it, it has impacts on it. It also impacts other livelihoods like fisheries and um, we've also seen huge um, in a huge increase in violence sand mining related violence in the year 2019 2020 nearly 100 and more than 193 people were killed because of sand uh, because they objected to sand mining and these are all sorts of people they were lawyers they were police officers and farmers they were journalists um, so it's really really having a massive massive impact on um, if you can't think of any other resource where, you know, this kind of scale. Um, just to help you understand the scale, um, there was a recent research by Professor Daniel Franks from the Sustainable Mineral Institute at the University of Queensland. And he said, if you look at the amount of gold that has been produced in all of history, it would fill about three Olympic sized swimming pools. But if you look at the amount of sand and gravel that we are extracting from our ecosystems every year, it wouldn't fill even 10 million Olympic sized swimming pools. That's the kind of scale, massive, absolutely massive scale that we are extracting from ecosystems. Land reclamation, uh, you see here uh, fishermen trying to stop dredgers. There's, um, uh, a market where about 20,000 fishermen sell their catch and all their livelihood is in jeopardy. You find similar scenes in Bombay also around the uh, Mumbai, around the 
coastal uh, coastal road uh, reclamation land reclamation scene. Um, and industry, for example, uses sand. Um, we extract many me metals and minerals that go into a building a variety of things. And I just want to underscore that this is a global problem. It's not just a problem with developing economies. It's a problem across the world. Um, and I'd like to play this particular video. They want to extract millions of tons of iron ore. Imagine a giant open cast mine under the sea. We'll be able to see the ships. While they dig 20 meters down into the seabed and suck up the sand, killing every living creature in its way. Wrecking food chain. We're only kids, and even we get it. The government and the mining companies know all this, but they just don't seem to care. It's all about the money for them. Why wreck our seabed just for money? I want my children. And my children's children. To be able to enjoy this beach. And go surfing and go fishing, like I do. Why does this government, or any government, think they have the right to sell our sand? No one asked me. No one asked me. Or me. It's our future they're messing with. They want to... So, as you can see, it's absolutely um, huge, the kind of scale that we're talking about, extracting sand from a huge number of ecosystems, sensitive ecosystems. Um, and I want to share my personal story. So I grew up in Bangalore and some of my earliest memories are about waking up at two or three in the morning to help my family fetch water from a public tap. Um, and at the same time, as I grew up, I read reports about you know, rivers being decimated because of sand mining. And I knew that the sand was essential for concrete and all the buildings that we we're building. At the same time, it was coming from such sensitive uh, uh, places like River Kaveri and things. So this kind of contrast got to me and that's what made me decide to study further and uh, take it up. Are we, how, we cannot continue to operate in this way, but we need solutions. So are there solutions? Uh, I'd like us to move from what is as it is currently to imagining what if we built our world differently? What if we designed our economy in a, in a different manner? At the moment, our economy is a very, very linear economy. We extract materials at great cost um, it's not reflected in the cost of sand, and most of the true cost is externalized onto society and the environment. And at the end of life, when we demolish buildings, we simply throw this away, throw the material away in landfills. So you find landfills that are increasing in volume. Um, a World Economic Forum report a few years ago said that less than a third of construction and demolition waste is recovered and reused. And that's a shame. If you consider the amount of destruction we are causing in extracting this material, we absolutely need to look at how we can do things differently. So I'd like to give you examples from different parts of the world. These are examples of people who are taking matters into their own hands, private enterprises, um, just doing things, exploring uh, solutions. Here's an example of rammed earth construction in Ghana. Um, they use very little cement in order, but most um, and use earth in order to build. You can see it's possible to build beautiful houses, live live well um, with construction like this. This is another practice, closer home. It's a practice called made in earth. Uh, you see they are building uh, apartment complexes in Adobe. They're also on the right. You see images of a community college that they are building with local natural materials. So it's absolutely possible to build uh, it differently. Here's an example from the UK. This is called uh, this this particular community used straw bale insulation basically to and uh, they managed to achieve a 90 percent reduction in, in uh, annual gas consumption. So that's it's incredible. Uh, when we use materials like straw bales, uh, for example, they are a renewable resource. They are a regenerative form of um, construction. So these kind of methods would really help. 
so timber is another um, you know great example the German environment ministry decided to build with timber in greater Paris for example there are now buildings being constructed with raw earth as long as uh, the buildings are built with a strong foundation and a strong roof to protect them against the, the weather. These buildings are absolutely beautiful, very modern. They look uh, fantastic. And why raw earth? Raw earth because this material can then be recycled and reused in order to build. It's great for human health. It's great for the planet. Uh, it contains no volatile organic compounds. So it's, it's really, uh, it maintains the perfect temperature indoors. So, uh, this is another method that we can use, an alternative way of construction. And remember, I spoke about construction and demolition waste. Um, usually when we think about waste, we think about something that's really dirty, something that's not very pleasing. But I'd urge you to look at these buildings. The one on the left is, a, is, a, uh, from, is in New York. And uh, the entire facade has been built from bricks that are made from construction and demolition waste. It's this company called Stone Cycling that was featured in, the, in my book. And they have been uh, awarded, they placed fourth in the most innovative company in the Netherlands. On the right, you see the picture of another uh, Starbucks drive through in Europe. Again, bricks made from construction and demolition waste. Absolutely beautiful. If we are able to scale up this particular way, these kind of solutions, then the kind of change that we can achieve is absolutely tremendous. So I'd like to share the city uh, of Amsterdam's example. They have um, committed to becoming a fully circular city by 2050. And by 2030, that's less than 10 years away, they aim to halve the use of natural, res uh, natural resources that go into buildings. So that's the kind of ambition, that's the kind of um, drive we want, to, we want to see being replicated across the world. And just to kind of conclude this and give you some examples of you know, further resources, um, donut economics is the model that, that has inspired Amsterdam to, to take on this challenge. And I'd urge you to read it. If you haven't read that book, it, it's a must read especially for students of economics. It's very accessible, so you don't need to be an economics student in order to read it, so feel free. I'd also urge you to watch this award-winning documentary, Sam Bors, and my book, of course. Uh, I've uh, sent another library copy to Anita Mam, and she will make that available to you. Um, particularly because it's, we're talking about Bangalore, I'd like you to watch this five-minute documentary on saving uh, sand mining in River Kaveri. Um, and if possible, support the work of NGOs like Save River Kaveri, Awas Foundation, SANDRP, many other organizations. So in a nutshell, that's, that's what I'd like you to think about. Um, and Anita Ma'am also asked me to talk about uh, when, when you want to uh, I understand that many of you have uh, decided to study abroad and uh, she asked me to give a few, uh, you know, a few words about what to expect when you, when you come to study abroad. Um, I can speak from personal experience, having grown up uh, in, in, in India and coming here to study, it was, well, I, I worked as a soft skill trainer before I came here, so it was not completely new to me. But it was still quite uh, quite different, and you need the one thing that you do need to be prepared for is um, out here the onus is on you to take to to further your your career to further your learning. Um, whereas in India you, you're almost spoon fed in in what you need to learn and what you need to um, how you need how you need to progress. But out here it's completely up to you. Uh, I think. Um, Learning how to learn is very, very important out here. Um, as, is, as is time management, you would be expected to, you know, you would expect you, it's, I think in, in terms of culture, uh, it's 
in India, I think it's it's okay to be five minutes late or ten minutes late, but that wouldn't be acceptable yeah, when you go abroad. You'd be expected to keep the time and start exactly and stop exactly. You know, that's uh, ki kind of expected. And uh, yeah, that's that's uh, in a nutshell. That's all I had to say. And I would be very happy to take your questions. And uh, that's it. So I uh, thank you very much. ma'am that was truly enlightening and thought provoking hope people will join the crusade to protect such a valuable natural resource now i invite mr neeraj tom savio for the q and a session um so it has been brought to my attention that people are not able to access the chat box so i have enabled people to be able to unmute themselves and ask questions so i would like uh, all participants to be able to interact with the speaker and ask whatever questions that they have. Um, I had a question. Sure. First of all, great talk. I really enjoyed it. Um, Thank you. Uh, my question was, how can we as students of our nation help overcome the sand challenge? Um, so to answer that, I think I think uh, learning, informing yourself is the first step. So learning as much as you can about it is a is the first step. Also getting involved in activities of NGOs and um, seeing what they do, how they do, how they um, work is, is also a potential uh, way to learn more about the situation. Um, it starts with casual conversation. You know, it's 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 an irony of uh, this particular challenge is that we know more about gold mining than we know more about sand mining. It's so um, there's so little data on this particular challenge. So if you are interested in further research, absolutely take on this. Uh, look at look at various aspects of this. If this particular topic branches out into so many different domains, whether it's public health or or uh, environmental conservation or you know wild biodiversity and wildlife or plenty more. Um, topics that it branches out into. So it's absolutely something that you could consider. Thank you, ma'am. Uh, ma'am, I'd like to ask you a question. Could you give sure. us a bit of insight into your book? Uh, yes, ma'am. Sure. Um, so this particular book is, um, it's, um, it, it took me quite a few years to write it because I was writing, uh, researching this as an independent researcher and writing it. I personally, I hate uh, doom and gloom literature. I don't like talking about problems that seem to have absolutely no solutions, right? Because I feel it kind of brings us down further and, and there's no, it doesn't seem uh, encouraging. So my intention in writing this book was to ensure that when we talk about environmental problems, there are always solutions that we can look for. And, and that's what I uh, did with the book. So I've divided the book into three sections. In the first section, I talk about the use of sand and how we use it in a huge variety of industries, whether it's energy or whether it's uh, glass or metals or land reclamation, things like that, uh, concrete. And the second section, I talk about the impacts of this kind of uh, usage. In the third uh, part of the book, I talk about solutions, potential solutions, what different people across the world are doing, um, how we can scale this up. I give solutions that are immediately applicable and some things that will take time to develop, but in the long run will uh, help us develop a circular economy. So. I hope that answers your question. Yes, ma'am. Thank you, ma'am. Could we have the next question? Participants, you can just unmute your mic and ask a question. Uh, could I, I ask you something, Kiran? Yes, of course. This is Marion here. 
I uh, I really enjoyed your book and and uh, being a science and environment journalist, there were a lot of positives which came out of it. What I felt was, uh, you know, your point about using debris uh, from buildings. Why isn't that point pushed a little more? You know, instead of destroying nature here in Bangalore, we fill our lakes with debris. Now, that's a very positive point that you're talking about, that it could be reused for rebuilding. And uh, also, you know, the solutions that you found about straw baling and, uh, you know, things like using waste, all sorts of different waste. Uh, why can't we look at those kind of solutions? And that's what you brought out so beautifully. Uh, that is something that I hope our city fathers look at. And thank you for that in your book. My pleasure. Uh, I think for me, um, it's I think we are on the right track, but we need to kind of uh, awareness within um, among, among citizens is so low that there's no there's no demand for this kind of thing. Once we start create, raising awareness among, um, you know, everyday people, then um, we can demand for such solutions and uh, it's important to know that India has um, updated its standards. It now allows up to 20% um, use of recycled material, uh, recycled concrete, basically to in, in reinforced concrete applications. Um, so we're on the right track, but we have a long way to go. The city of Zurich, for example, is using up to 98%, is building buildings with 98% recycled concrete, and India is at 20%. You know? So that's the kind of scale uh, we, have, we have to go. And um, India is one among the top three countries that extract and use sand. It's uh, China, um, India, and then the, and the USA. So um, it's absolutely critical that we kind of make speed up these these solutions. It's possible. We just need to demand better solutions. Thank you, ma'am. Uh, may we have the next question, please? Ma'am, I'd like to ask a question. Sure. Uh, what are the biggest impediments to uh, transitioning to a stand-free economy, according to you? Uh, lack of awareness. According to me, I think it's lack of awareness. Um, because I don't think we realize how many things it goes into. Um, you know, all the, the paints and we extract minerals that go into paints and plastics and paper and uh, mobile phones and you know things like that uh, so it's important to know that um, there's a there's this i think our supply chains there's so much distance between where these materials are extracted and the end user that we kind of lose the the link in the olden days maybe we kind of extracted earth from locations and we used it to build our own places. So we knew exactly the amount, the impact that we were creating. But our modern economy is built in such a way that it's very, very hard to to realize the impact of what we're doing. And once people begin to realize, I do believe that they will, uh, you know, ask for you can you can see all across the world people don't want to use plastic anymore because the kind of damage it's inflicting on wildlife people don't want to use palm oil anymore because they know that it's coming from places that are it's destroying forests and things so i think you'll see the same kind of shift also with construction and sand and um i'm, I'm not entirely sure we can go to a sand free economy it's just that the way we use it needs to change. When we use it, we need to use it in a manner that we can reuse it. You make it a circular economy. And the challenge with the circular economy, that, um, 
let me share with you is that uh, you know, glass, for example, right? When they when they make glass, I told you it's about 70% silica sand that goes into making glass panes. Um, if you talk about laminated glass for insulation, uh, that's very commonly used here in Europe uh, and other parts of the world. This laminated glass is made by, uh, or even the glass that is used for um, uh, windscreens or in cars and things like that. This particular safety glass, laminated glass, is made by uh, sandwiching a plastic layer in between two panes of glass. Okay, and that plastic layer is what uh, um, gives it that. So when it shatters, it does it doesn't break and and, and harm people. It kind of shatters. It breaks um, in a safe manner. However, uh, you know how if you want to reuse that pane of glass when you are um, deconstructing or when you are destroy removing that to be reused um, if you crush it with the plastic layer then that plastic layer prevents it from being reused and recycled so it's very important uh, there's, there's something called upcycling and downcycling um, take this glass for example right you see that it it's colored glass but this color comes from a chemical that's been added now, if I mix this, if I crush it down along with another colored glass, then what's happening is that those chemicals become contaminants. So segregation at source is very important when you want to reuse. And this comes from the planning, uh, at, from when we plan the way, you know, whether it's a product or whether it's a city, we have to think about the end of life. How, how, what is going, how are we going to treat this material at the end of life? Can we reuse it? That's what we need to think about. Thank you, ma'am. Maybe you have the next question, please. Ma'am, I have a question. Sure. Uh, what would be a possible feasible alternative to sand? Uh, depends on the kind of use that you're talking about. So if it's construction, I showed you there are many different kinds of buildings that you can build. Ram the earth construction. Uh, is, is a great is a great way of um, building mud bricks. There are many examples in uh, even in Bangalore of buildings being built this way. So scaling up those kind of construction methods would be would be great. When it comes to extraction of uh, minerals, it's possible now people are trying to find how we can extract minerals from renewable resources rather than non renewable resources. So those are the kind of uh, alternatives that are available. Thank you, ma'am. Uh, maybe have the next question, please. Ma'am, uh, I have a question. My name is Parmija, and I'm part of the faculty in, in the Department of Economics. So I just wanted to know how I haven't read your book. But I would like to have known where did you, where, what kind of methods did you use to get information? Because you did say there wasn't much information available, right? And also, what are the kinds of things that we could do? You said you had suggested we join some of the NGOs, such as ABAs or any something like that. But if there's something more also that we could do. Yes, that's yes, so for, so for faculty, faculty members, members, I can hear an echo of my but, voice. Is that? Uh, ma'am, you can just mute yourself. Yes, yes, ma'am, you can go ahead. Karen, ma okay, go great. Um, uh, so I think faculty members would find um, more and more um, a, a growing number of research uh, papers on uh, uh, on the global sand crisis. Um, some of them are open access. It's worth uh, reading the UNEP report from 2019. They provide a huge number of sources. The methods I used range from um, reading academic literature to gray literature, as well as expert interviews. Um, so I, I travel to uh, so I, I, I travel to quarries to, to to look at how they were recycling sand and uh, converting construction demolition debris into neatly segregated fractions of, of sand and gravel and things like that. So that's those are the kind of methods uh, are used um, over several years. 
And um, yeah, for particularly for faculty members, I think it's a good starting point to kind of look at. Uh, uh, there are open access papers as well as uh, papers behind paywalls of uh, on this particular topic. I hope that answers your question. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. Could we have the next question, please? Uh, the participants, especially the students, are reminded to take use of this opportunity. It's not every day that we get such an eminent speaker to address us on an important question of resource economics. Uh, so especially the students, a large, a large number of our participants who are pursuing economics are kindly requested to make use of this opportunity and ask any, and ask any questions or any clarifications that they would want answered. Thank you. Hi, Mom, I have a question. Sure. Do you think that uh, one of the main reasons as to why we're lagging behind in, you know, uh, using recyclable uh, materials for construction is because our waste segregation is uh, not up to the mark? Because I think we lag a lot in waste segregation. So do you think that's one of the main reasons as to why this is happening? Yes, it's uh, it is definitely one of the important reasons. Also, we lack data. We're not collecting data on how much waste is being generated, um, and and uh, that's an impediment. If if uh, ministries need to plan, they need sufficient data, and that's that's the missing point right now. Um, in addition to just dumping debris and not segregating at source. Thank you, ma'am. Uh, may we have the next question, please? Why is it? I'm sorry, I can't hear that question. I believe that's a technical error. Uh, Sanjana, if you're speaking, uh, we can't hear you right now. I believe there's a technical error on that side. We shall move on to the next question in the meantime. Uh, may we have the next question, please? Um, hello, can you hear me? Yes. Hi, hi. so um, uh, um, my question might not be directly related to the point at hand, but anyway, I'm planning to apply for a master's in Germany and for economics. So what do you think about the whole higher education situation there? In Germany is great. It's uh, uh, it's absolutely great. They have a very supportive uh, system for academic researchers and students and things like that. So. Oh, I'm definitely very glad to hear that. Do, do you think I should look out for something in particularly in Anything? Um, I think that would depend on your individual context, but I, I would absolutely encourage you to, to to explore as many options as you can. It's uh, it's a great option. You'd get exposed to, um, I think, research from across the world. Right, ma'am. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, may we move on to the next question, please? Sanjana, if you could try unmuting now. And... Ma'am, in your opinion, why do you think sand mining isn't talked about as much? That's a million dollar question. I think I should ask you, why do you think this is, this is um, you know, this is a topic that has been um, ignored so far. It seems to fall in our blind spot for some, for some reason, right? Um, I think there are a lot of, lot of powerful vested interests involved in this particular business, especially in India. It's a topic that's very convenient to, you know, to be forgotten. Um, as long as people don't know and they don't care, the status quo can continue. So it's very important for citizens to get involved 
to take into account to know that there are solutions being implemented across the world, even in Bangalore, uh, and to scale up these kind of solutions. Do we have Ma'am, how questions? do these SPS students get involved uh, in spreading more awareness about this? Uh, I think uh, somebody else also asked this question. As students, I think your first role should be to learn as much as you can about it. Um, so read up, read read up papers, read up books, watch documentaries. You know, uh, explore as much as you can about. Um, not just the problem, but also solutions. Um, and that would be a great Sydney starting point. I'm, so sorry. I'm sorry, I, I missed that. At the civic level, how would you suggest we take action? At the civic level? Oh, uh, I think joining um, existing organizations that are already actively working on this would be a great starting point. Instead of reinventing the wheel, um, it you would you would um, it would be a win win for for you to kind of learn more for for those organizations to also get the support they require. Just find out if there are any organizations working um, in your vicinity to protect lakes, to protect rivers, to protect coastlines, um, and support them. Support their work. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, do we have any more questions? Hi Kiran, this is Anita here. Uh, Kiran, I have a question. We have a paper on environmental economics, um, mm -hmm. a departmental elective. Now, if we have to incorporate something to do with, say, the challenges of science and mining, so what is your suggestion and how we could incorporate it in our curriculum? Any um, so there are, I think, um, the University of Geneva, for example, is doing some fantastic work on on, uh, on this particular challenge. They have um, students form batches um, and explore the problem from a wide different uh, variety of angles. If you go to my website, you will see there's a project from SandX, a group called SandX. This particular group went to quarries and they interviewed the uh, experts. Uh, they interviewed uh, people from the quarry to find out what is the problem? You know, where is it being extracted? Are there any zones where it shouldn't be extracted from? Things like that. Actual um, interviews and then kind of other students um, developed a game um, that then they they they, uh, they took to to industry conferences and. Um, you know, play, helped professionals play the game and see if uh, give feedback on whether this game mattered, things like that. So there are different ways in Sri Lanka, for example, there's a there's an NGO called Sri Lanka Water Partnership. They're doing phenomenal work in partnering with uh, um, on going to schools and educating them on on this problem and what they can do. I think there are different ways to tackle it. It really depends on your the resources available to you and I would be very, very happy to kind of uh, get involved and support you more. Uh, I was looking at maybe we could include it as a theoretical framework in our syllabus. Yes. So any suggestions on that? Um, I, I, I would say yes. <laughs> I don't know um, enough. I think maybe we can have a chat uh, about this a little uh, uh, offline, but I think I think it's definitely possible to to explore this. There are people looking at it from a political ecology perspective. There, are, um, so yes, I would say yes. All right, thank you, Kiran. My pleasure. Thank you, Anita, ma'am. Uh, I believe we have reached the end of our question and answer session. So we shall. Uh, I shall now request our MC to take over. Thank you, Mr. Neeraj. Uh, I request Ms. Sachina Chopra, the President of Economics Forum, to present the vote of thanks. Thank you, Tanishka. Uh, 
Uh, on behalf of the Department of Economics of St. Joseph's College, Bangalore, I would like to extend my gratitude to Ms. Kiran Pereira, founder and chief storyteller of Science Stories, for coming to this platform and sharing her invaluable knowledge with our students and professors. I would like to extend our immense gratitude to our principal, Father Dr. Victor Lobo SJ, the registrar, Dr. Melvin Colasso, the rector, and all the vice principals. The, manage, the management of St. Joseph's College, uh, members of the organizing and the technical committee who include Professor Clement D'Souza, Professor Anita, uh, head of the Department of Economics, Mr. Keshav Murthy, uh, Ms. Teresa Joy, Dr. Tolika Bhattacharya, Ms. Anne Francis, Dr. Padmaja, Ms. Risa Elisa Joseph, and Dr. Nikhil Ja. From the technical committee, I'd like to thank Neeraj, Shraddha, Zoe, Tanishka, and Arjun for making it possible for us to have this webinar. Lastly, I'd like to thank all of our participants of this webinar for turning up in force and demonstrating their interest in such a crucial topic and for making this webinar a success. Thank you, Ms. Sanjana.